The following message was recorded at an event hosted by Desiring God. More information about Desiring God events, conferences, and resources is available at www.desiringgod.org. Dr. Larry Crabb is the Director of Biblical Counseling at Colorado Christian University in Denver, Colorado. And Dr. C. Samuel Storms is the pastor of Christ Community Church in Ardmore, Oklahoma. Let me invite you to begin. Who has a question? Right here in front. Say there has been someone in and out of counseling for years and their thorn remains and they are angry. Why hasn't God healed me after so many times of crying out? What do you say? Restate the question. <clears throat> the question is, what do you do? Am I on? Yes. What do you do when... Um, when someone who has been out of counseling perhaps for a number of years asking God for certain things that haven't, haven't happened, he hasn't answered their prayer, and they feel a rage and anger toward, toward God, um, you're, that, that's, that's the, the problem. You're asking, what do you say to that person? What do you do with that person? Well, I think one of the difficulties in my position as a counselor is I'm often asked very methodological questions. And just to say what to do in that particular situation, I think, is an impossible thing for me to say without having the person in front of me. That's why at our advanced seminars, we play videotapes of live counseling so we can give some indication as to how we actually, what we would say, how we would interact. I can respond conceptually more easily than I can methodologically without taking more time. So let me give you a brief conceptual answer. My response, I never forget... Um, uh, a man named Buck Hatch is a professor of, uh, has been a professor at Columbia Bible College for a number of years, and he was the speaker at Bill's memorial service last March. And he's 79 years old. He had lost his son. One of his four sons died of a heart attack about a year before Bill died in the airplane crash. And uh, he looked out at the front row where mom and dad and Phoebe, my sister-in-law, Kurt and Karen, Bill's two kids, and Rachel and I were sitting there. And um, with, a, with a power that I've rarely felt from the pulpit, I felt power many times, but this was an exquisite power. He looked at our family and he said, ask your questions because you'll find God in the middle of your questions. That meant a great deal to me because I find that most of us ask questions that God answers very differently than we anticipate him asking, or that we anticipate the way he's going to answer. First John talks about little children, young men, and fathers in First John 2, and some take that to be three levels of maturity, which I think it might be, because there are three things that are mentioned very differently about each category. I think little children ask the question, God, do you really care about me when things happen? And I think God's answer is, not the way you expect me to. And then to use Lewis's line in Narnia, I think the Lord says, I'm good, but I'm not safe. And then young men, when they get involved in the struggles of life, they say, God, will you help? And sometimes God says, not the way you expect me to. I'm, I'm strong, but I'm not cooperative. Not with your agendas am I always cooperative. And that produces a confusion for me. And then the young men continue to ask, but God, I'm hurting, will you heal? And sometimes God says, N not the way you intend, because I'm very tender, but I'm not always soothing. And then finally, the older men, I think, finally say, God, will you reveal yourself to me? And I think God's answer is yes, but in my way and in my time. And I think the fact that God answers questions in a way that we don't anticipate challenges our understanding of God and forces us to expand our view of him. I really do believe that the core struggle, or one of them, that's too strong, one of the core struggles in the human soul is to, is to look at life and to conclude that God is good. I don't think you can. I think it's very tough to do that. You've got to have other data. You've got to have revelation. Look at life, it's pretty hard to conclude that whoever's in charge of this thing is doing a good job. Um, and I think that coming to God, wrestling with him as Jacob wrestled and, and, and going, going down to the mat with him with our questions, but, but still coming to him, I think at some point he gradually reveals more of the fact that although he's not the way we think he is, he's far better than our wildest dreams. I would encourage that raging person, that angry person, to look at the roots of their anger, to look at the fact that their anger really reflects a demand that God be a certain thing which they're insisting is necessary. Therefore, they're requiring themselves to be sovereign and God to be cooperative, and he will not meet us in those terms. It's for John Piper, and it's a question about uh, re repressed memories and what, what role they play in uh, the way you, you minister in people's lives. They don't play much of a role at all in the way I, I minister. I, I uh, 
it's an uncharted territory for me. Um, my hope and my prayer is that in talking about the realities that I do remember, that I do know about the present struggles that I have and in dealing with the scriptures that I do understand, that the Lord will apply that to hundreds of people on Sunday morning, enabling them to do what they need to do with it. Um, I think, I'm just thinking out loud here of what the Lord might be doing in that regard that I'm not planning for him to do, namely trying to create an atmosphere in which if the Lord were pleased to bring to people's minds damaging things that happened to them in the past, there would be an atmosphere and a context in which they could be dealt with without fearing that uh, that sort of thing would be scoffed at. But I, I don't do much extensive long-term counseling. I don't do any, I don't do any long-term counseling in my office, and the little that I do do... Um, Whenever I hear people describing backgrounds that are manifestly discouraging and have gone a long way into making them the pain people that they are, I try to resonate with that and create a sense of hope. In, in a sense, my answer to that is the same one I would have given to Tom's question about what do you say to somebody who's angry with God because over the long haul they didn't get changed or their circumstance didn't get changed. And I think that uh, th those people usually, if they're in the church, know the answer to that question already. Uh, namely, they need to learn to trust the goodness of God who uh, his frowning face hides a smiling. I mean, the, the what does that verse go? Uh, God's purposes will ripen fast, unfolding every hour. The bud may have a bitter taste, but sweet will be the flower. They know that in their head. And I think what people need is illustrations, especially from Scripture, where that was true. So that I'm always looking for new ways to hold out to people hope in the goodness of God in biblical circumstances that don't look hopeful. And the most recent one, and I'll, I'll stop, is I was reading through Matthew, and, and James and John's mother come, and they say, Grant that my sons, James and John, sit at your right hand, sit at your right hand and your left. And Jesus said, uh, Well, they will drink the cup that I will drink, but it is not mine to give them that. It is for whom it has been prepared. In other words, that was a prayer given to the Savior for a privilege for her sons, and he said, uh, I can't answer that prayer because my love for James and John, having brought them into the inner ring of the special three, cannot be used to decide that I defer in my affections for them towards the wisdom of my Father for whoever he has that prepared. Now, there's just another little glimmer. And had I read that in my devotions yesterday morning and sat down in a counseling session with somebody today who presented me with an unanswered prayer, I would have told them that story. And I believe in a year that would come back to me. You know, Pastor, the story you told me about James and John and their mother who didn't get her prayer answered because Jesus had an affection for her sons, but he submitted his affection to the Father's wisdom wisdom and didn't fulfill it, that really meant a lot. I think the Lord gives to pastors in their devotional life words for the afternoon's counseling that no amount of training probably would do it. Sam, are you uh, ready to speak over there? <laughs> okay, the question has to do with um, are there special pre-evangelistic or evangelistic um, Concerns for codependent people, and uh, you think? Well, I give, I give an experience. This is John Piper at, talking. At root, those people know it won't cut it to say they're good at the bottom, and and therefore you've got a common ground already with the people who've been taught a wrong assessment of their deepest problem. Because God has already taught them. God has written something in there that tells them, I've got a deeper problem. I had, I had a couple come in to tell me after 
years of sexual therapy, and they just oozed the language of codependency. And I gave them about a 10-minute spiel of my sense of its inadequacy, and their mouths just were open the whole time. That sounds, that sounds exactly right. They were both kind of saying, well, yes, that's right. That's, that was the reaction I got, that somebody had cheated them. They had cheated them for not having told them that beneath all this struggle to find that they weren't really defective, there was a kind of defection that God deals with at a deeper level. So I think you can do that with unbelievers. I think written on their hearts is a sense of need to get right with the living God that is beneath and under what else they've been taught. I concur with that. I think that um, I think that one of the greatest counterfeits of conviction is what is, is what people call self-contempt. Um, a lot of us are, are full of self-contempt. Oh, I'm just no good. I just can't handle this. My husband's never loved me. I'm just a no good wife. Uh, my kids are bad. It tells me I'm a terrible parent. And people go on and on and on in terms of their self-contempt. And I think that in, in evangelizing folks who are full of self-contempt, you need to be very, very clear that they're not anywhere as close to convicted of sin when they use that language. And we need to expose their self-contempt as essentially pride and not merely a deficit that needs to be affirmed. So I, I want to work through their self-contempt as a, as a proud kind of a thing, because why, the reason it's pride is they're basically saying that, that, um, that I need to expect myself to be better than this in order to make life work as it should. And then to say, you know, that's the position you're taking, and I, th I think John is very right, that you know that somewhere down deep you're not better and as a matter of fact, it isn't just a matter that you're, you know, a bad person because your mother didn't love you, but that um, where where have you where have you evidenced the energy of radical other centeredness? Um, and you start getting into that, and you you cut through the self contempt to get down to the real conviction of sin. But I think that we have a major problem with the codependency movement that it really has replaced conviction with contempt. And that's a major, major problem. And we must not view contempt as a good step toward the gospel. It's not. It's a step away from the gospel to, do, to, 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 to call that our problem. The only thing that I'd want to say about that is that in dealing with someone who shows... Uh, symptoms of so-called codependency. Uh, I, it seems as if whether they are um, Christian or non-Christian that we're attempting to evangelize, I eventually get back to the issue of, and I'll just use the same word, dependency. Um, that the bottom line is the inherent native as well as willful refusal to cling to Christ and to Christ alone. And that the, the ultimate answer, obviously for the non-Christian and even for the Christian who's wrestling with those issues, is what I can only call an, an absolutely raw dependency upon the grace of Christ and, and the forgiveness of Christ. And... Um, uh, I have, I have, I believe very deeply in something that Larry mentioned. Uh, he's mentioned it, in, I think, in a couple of his books and especially in his seminars. And that is that that perhaps I'm not going to say the fundamental, but one of the fundamental elements in sin is is this notion of misplaced dependency. And maybe you'd want to, uh, since we're talking about the notion of dependency, it's uh, it's that. Uh, the fact that every individual is uh, comes into this life, as David tells us in Psalm 51, as we're told elsewhere, um, uh, doggedly determined to make life work without having to depend on God, without having to cling to the reality of His grace, knowing uh, that with the first sin that we commit, we forfeit all right to life. And that the only thing that we uh, deserve really is death. Um, so I would, uh, in dealing, whether dealing with a, a Christian or a non-Christian so-called codependent, I would, I would address them at the whole issue of dependency, since that seems to be a problem. The way Larry defined it the, this morning, um, 
this dependency upon others um, for acceptance, this uh, becoming whatever you have to, the notion of false self, uh, to avoid rejection at all costs so that you don't add to my sense of shame. And it seems to me that what the motive, the energy behind that is, I have to do that because the only alternative I have is dependency upon grace, and that terrifies me. That is horrifying to think that the bottom line is the only person who really is trustworthy uh, is God. So I, I would approach the whole issue through exploring the notion of dependency and, and getting back to the fact that uh, it is a raw dependency clinging um, to Christ and, and the forgiveness that is available in Him. Okay, it's a, it's a question directed to uh, Dr. Storms and Dr. Crabb. Uh, about the balance between uh, agonizing with all the energy that uh, the Lord provides, Colossians 129, and recognizing your own finitude, your own limitations. How do you strike that balance in your own lives and ministries? Larry, you want to begin? I depend on my wife. Um, when, when, I'm, uh, when, I, when I'm relating to her in a way that makes her feel shut out, then it's time for me to take a look at how much I'm giving. When I get, um, oh, six months ago, uh, we got talking about our kids, and she said, the way you're talking about our kids hurts me so much. And I was just getting impatient and irritated. Why They should be doing this and this and this. And I realized that I think that um, I, think that I was just um, moving too fast. And I, and, I, and I had to back down. I don't have any problem with admitting that even though the inexhaustible resources of Christ are there, he's putting it through a rather finite, messed up person. Um, and there are, there are times when I'm not relating well to the people that I love the most, that I have the greatest responsibility to, my wife and children. Uh, when, those, when those things suffer, then I'm willing to, to back off. I heard the story years ago, I think Howard Hendricks told at Dallas Seminary. Maybe you've heard it, Sam. Maybe it's an old classic I don't know about. Some seminary student that was just falling apart in some very visible ways. And Hendricks said, when's the last time you went out and had a good time? And the guy used to be a fisherman. He hadn't gone fishing in 10 years because he was too busy with the studies and witnessing and lots of other things. And Hendricks said, go fishing. And uh, I think there's a, there's a real place for that when you find that your close relationships are suffering the most. I don't think you need to feel guilty about if you've got to prevail upon God for more grace so you can go back to ministering to everybody in the world. I think that's craziness. I, I agree completely. And I, the verse that came to mind when you asked the question was, uh, I believe it's 2 Corinthians 4. Um, we are earthen vessels. We're clay pots. And uh, we need to remember that sometimes. Granted, the gospel is a treasure, uh, but we are clay pots. And... Uh, I agree totally. I think uh, when it when you begin to see that it's impacting other vital relationships, you might have to step back. This, I don't know, is it is it legitimate for me to ask a question of Larry? Because this came up this morning when he was uh, when you were talking, and, and we talked about it uh, during lunch. This question of uh, of setting boundaries and, and limits on what we can or cannot do, and. Um, it did come to my mind that perhaps there is a difference between what freedom you have in that regard as a counselor, a non-pastor, as over against a pastor in a church. And I'm wondering if the expectations that people have of us differ uh, in terms of our availability, uh, in terms of uh, do you have do you feel as if you have a a greater freedom, uh, perhaps, to, to take the phone off the hook and to be unavailable than perhaps a pastor might? Or, do you, do you, or is, is the way that you deal with that something that ought to apply in, in, in a church situation? Certainly there are differences, I think, in expectations. When I speak about the pressures on me, I'm speaking not as a private practitioner. I'm no longer in private practice. Um, I'm, I'm speaking not only in terms of speaking engagements and a meeting like this where sometimes folks want to chat, but I'm speaking more about my little community where I teach a graduate program of 66 students who are on our campus for a year, and, and that, that's, that's kind of almost like my church. I almost pastor them in a, in a sense. I think there's some real differences, but there are some similarities. But I would argue that um, while the expectations on you folks as pastors um, are going to be somewhat unique, I think there's some overlap, but somewhat unique, Speaking as an outsider, and you can all 
gear and throw shoes or whatever you want to do. Um, but speaking as an outsider, I, I think that there needs to be some recognition that you need to communicate, that that you you're not in the business of meeting up to people's expectations, um, and that you're going to simply have to frustrate some folks, and that can be a wonderful thing for their growth. And I think there there come a point when you when you can't do it, and you ought to say I I can't and I and I won't. Um, I used to when I when I would be asked to do certain things, I used to try to find some way to make up an excuse that it's noble. You know, I, I can't do it because I've got to, and say something by explanation. And um, now I'll say something like I can't do it because I want to go to the movies tonight. And and that I think that there's, there, there's a there's a place for being very human about that. And when the expectations get frustrated, make that the topic of conversation next time. And that would not not be a bad Sunday evening series. Hey, let me can I follow that up with a personal example? Um, one particular lady that I've worked with for two years now um, had reached a real point of crisis of which I was not aware. Uh, the last time we had uh, met, she seemed to be progressing, and this was like on a Monday. And uh, it was Saturday, and I was. it was 725, and we had a, a worship service at the church that Saturday night for which I was responsible and it was to start at 7.30, and my wife was uh, on the ladies' retreat at the church, and so I had our two daughters, and I was running to get out of there, and I had a responsibility, and I got a phone call. She was on the phone, and um, she said something to the effect, uh, I could tell that she was upset. Uh, I just needed someone to talk to. And I said, well, I'd love to, uh, perhaps... You know, when I get home tonight around 9 or 9.30, you can call me then or I'll even meet you tomorrow at church. And she said, oh, that's all right. And she hung up. Well, I went ahead to to the meeting and and came back and uh, uh, she had again attempted suicide that night after she got off the phone with me because she was convinced that if she couldn't trust in me to be there for her when she needed me, that there wasn't any reason for living. And she was, uh, we had to put her in a a hospital for several months, three days later. And I I had a real hard time wrestling with that. I've gone over in my mind a hundred times how should I have reacted to that? Was I insensitive? Should I have picked up on signals she was sending after all I'd spent two years working with her? Um, And... It, it was deeply troubling to hear the words, if I can't count on you, uh, I haven't got anything left. Because she didn't feel she could count on her husband or anybody else in the church. And Well, that's, uh, I don't know, some of you may have been through a situation like that yourselves, but that's off. I don't know how to, I really don't know what to tell somebody else in a situation like that. Fortunately, she's doing great now, and we're on the best of terms, but... Um, whether I, w- I, I may have been wrong in doing it. I went into the hospital a couple of days later when she was strapped down, and, and I asked for her forgiveness. I may have been wrong in doing that. Maybe she needed to ask me for forgiveness. But I, I asked for her forgiveness, and she forgave me, and um, everything's fine now. But uh, at the time, that's a really difficult uh, circumstance to know how to handle, and I don't have any quick solutions for that. Two questions directed to Dr. Crabb. Uh, first, with regard to uh, his a- attitude toward defense mechanisms, and uh, the second, with regard to mental illness. Is there such a thing? Let me answer the second one first because it's easier. Um, I think, sure, there's such a thing as mental illness. If by mental illness you mean organic conditions that can result in, um, in, in, in behavioral disturbance that really have an organic basis, I think it's possible that manic depressive psychosis has some form of an organic basis. And uh, when I have a patient involved with the symptoms of manic depressive psychosis, I have no hesitancy in referral to an internist, to a psychiatrist for lithium. I don't have any problem with that. And I think there's probably a fair, a fair number of the schizophrenias that have perhaps some kind of a genetic predisposition or some kind of organic basis. The data's not in, but there seems to be enough to suggest it's really a possibility. And I wouldn't rule that out because obviously, as Jay Adams mentions, that, um, that there are a lot of physical conditions that do produce behavioral disturbances. 
Um, and when that's the case, then I'm out of my league. I think it's time for a physician to be involved, just as if you had tuberculosis. I wouldn't deal with that. That's a medical problem. And so I think there are certainly things that, 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 that rightly bear the label illness. That uh, doesn't mean that we as Christians have no place. We can certainly pray for healing. But as we pray for healing, I'm also very willing to be involved with the physician. Um, so that, that's my answer to that question, if that handles that all right. In terms of the first question, do I believe that all defense mechanisms are ultimately sinful? Um, I think that's too – I would not want to put it that way. I think that's, that's too um, oh, restricted a view. I, I think that uh, all of us in our, in our fallen world and in our fallen natures with fallen people interacting with us, um, until we come to a point of maturing more and more in Christ, there is going to, there is going to be a natural tendency to cope that I think maturity is going to replace with a tendency to trust. Um, I would not want to start off a counseling session um, by talking to you about your defense mechanisms and saying everything you're doing here is wrong, repent and, 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 and change. Um, but I, but I would want to, I would want to argue that that any effort that you're making to preserve your own soul through resources that you can manage, that ultimately, yeah, that grows out of the energy of depravity, and that's something which ultimately will be replaced entirely in glorification. Okay. The the, the question is, uh, I, I think uh, whether Dr. Crab thinks that uh, Larry uh, or how Larry Crab should have handled uh, this lady that uh, called him at five minutes before the evening service, and uh, when he didn't deal with her, she uh, didn't talk with her, she attempted suicide. Dr. Crab, would you give an, an assessment? Uh, please, please, please be gentle with our brother here. <laughs> um, I have no struggle at all with what he did. Um, in terms of going to church and, and not being responsive. I mean, let's, let's recognize our limitations, for goodness sakes. Um, and, and we do things that, that do sometimes have negative consequences, but they're unwitting. There was, not a, there was not a malice on Sam's part. There was not a, you know, get off my back. I'd rather do anything than talk with you at this point. I mean, if that were his mood, that obviously would need some th- thought. <laughs> uh, but that, that wasn't his mood. He had a church service to run. He had responsibilities to engage in. I don't see a thing wrong with what he did. Um, and, I, and I think, you know, he was wondering whether he was right or wrong in going to her to ask her forgiveness. And, and I think that's an open question. I would probably have felt that he didn't need to do that because I don't think he sinned against her. And I think that many times saying no to people is the very best thing for them because of what he was earlier pointing out, a misplaced dependency. For her to come to him and say that my life has no meaning if I can't even trust my pastor, that's putting a very unfair burden and a very wrong attitude. Um, because in the very same sense, we can't trust God the way we would like to be able to trust God. I mean, I, I, I pray whenever family members travel, I pray for safety. Do I believe that God's hand was on the plane that went down in Colorado Springs as much as it was on the hand of the planes that landed? My brother was flying standby that day. He got on that plane standby, the plane that crashed. Well, if you believe in a sovereign God, you've got to say that, that, that a sovereign God was in charge of all of that. So can I trust God to see to it that somebody else in my family doesn't die of a plane crash? No, I can't trust him for that. I, all I can trust him for is to express his goodness in ways that one day I'll fully praise him for, and by now I praise him by faith. And, um, and, and therefore, when this woman is basically saying, I cannot live if I can't trust my pastor, my, my response is, you can't give in to inappropriate demands from people and call it serving them. There are times you must say no, and that will frustrate and will sometimes lead people to do some disastrous things. And that's a great tragedy, and your heart breaks, and you must go through all the things that a sensitive man like Sam goes through. All the questioning. I've had two suicides in my career. Two clients of mine that suicided, one came late for an appointment and I had reason to be concerned. I called up relatives and they went to the home. And by the time they got there, this woman had killed her three children and herself. Well, you wrestle with that a little bit. Another fellow committed suicide on Christmas Day about 15 years ago. I was going to hospitalize him the next day. And on the 26th, he killed himself on the 25th. Um, you wrestle with that. And I think that Christians need to live in a whole lot of tension about those things. We just don't know what we're doing half the time. And there just needs to be a growing dependence on the fact that in the middle of our confusion and stumbling, God is going to get his work done through people whose heart is toward him. And my heart is toward him, and Sam's heart is toward him, and he's made a thousand mistakes, and I've made two thousand. But God's still going to get his work done through our lives, even though we're a mess. 
I presume that's for uh, Dr. Crabb, and it's a and it's a question about what cautions uh, should be uh, given for support groups in churches. Uh, the major thing I'd say is, is largely by way of reiteration that do understand the underpinnings of what normally goes on in a recovery group. Recovery groups, when we, when, 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 when we take something from our culture into our church, we're oftentimes dragging along uh, presuppositions that are antagonistic to what the pulpit's all about. And when you have that, you have tremendous possibilities for division. Therefore, before, I would encourage anything close to what might be called, I would not want a, a, a group that was called a recovery group in our church just because the label has been so associated with a secular mindset that I think is antithetical to the gospel. Um, I have no problem with, with Christians meeting together to support one another. When you come together, learn how to encourage one another. The Hebrews 10 talks about that. I think what I would want to do is, is I would want to devote a series of messages to the church's philosophy of group life. And what do we see groups, what, what does support in a Christian sense look like? What are we trying to accomplish in groups? Um, what do we see is wrong with people that groups can assist? What does biblical encouragement look like? I would want to talk about all those kinds of things, and I'd want to probably spend a fair amount of time with my leaders um, and to ask them very closely just what are, the, what are the theological understandings with which you approach the, 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 the group enterprise and see if some of the things that, that, re, that are reflected in the codependent movement are in their minds that are, I think are problematic. Uh, the, the whole 12-step thing, for example, I, I don't have the 12 steps memorized. I've read them a thousand times, but I couldn't tell you what they are in detail, all 12 of them. Um, a lot of people have pointed out that many of the actual steps are biblical things to do, uh, like a fearless moral, moral inventory. Is that a biblical thing to do? Well, sure it is, except that when, when you, um, um, at least it can be a biblical thing to do, when you, when you buy into a, into a certain presuppositionary set, then what often happens is what Melody Beatty talks about when she says that we must realize that the greatest sin that we commit is the failure to love ourselves. And so the fearless moral inventory ultimately comes down sometimes, not always, but ultimately can come down to the ways in which I refuse to take care of myself and value myself, and that becomes the primary sin. Well, is that kind of thinking creeping into your church? And if it is, I think you have a real problem. I don't think that's, that's right at all. But if you can, if you can keep it, uh, I, I personally would have a struggle using the 12 steps and even trying to Christianize them thoroughly simply because they're coming out of a, of a way of thinking that has a lot of stuff that I I find antagonistic to the gospel. And I think it's pretty hard to filter it enough. I think we as Christians could come up with an alternative. I'm not sure if I have one, but I think we could come up with an alternative that, that would not, you know, I'm not saying we ought to have 13 steps or 9 steps or something to, to distinguish us. I have a problem with the whole step mentality. Um, and this is a little tiny point that's terribly eisegetical, forgive me. But in Exodus 20, it does make the point there were no steps up to the altar. <laughs> and... Um, I um, wouldn't want to make a whole lot out of that. Um, but it seems to me that once we start programming ourselves to get to God by here's this pattern, then ultimately we're back to a broken cistern mentality, the Jeremiah 2.13, where, where God says the two sins, they've forsaken me, and they've, digging, they, they, they've dug for themselves broken cisterns. The point is something over which I have control. I want my water supply to be under my control. That's fallenness. And I think steps tend to appeal to that mentality. So that I struggle with, with steps as a major machinery to get to God, although I don't think there's anything wrong with certain steps as a way of kind of summarizing biblical teaching, but I struggle with the 12 steps as being a, a good thing that leads us in that direction. I'd love to hear other folks respond to that. Okay, the question is a, a critique of the uh, basic 12-step methodology of AA and many other addictive groups. The only thing I think I'd want to add is, is to reaffirm that really s tremendously important insight that if you take a, a shell like do fearless moral inventory, most people aren't as penetrating as Larry just was to say that there's, there is a conception of morality which you are using to do inventory. You, when you do inventory, you have a list, then you look on the shelf to see if the things on the list are there or not. And, and everything hangs on what's on the list. 
And if love yourself is the top of the list or some variety of it, rather than, say, the glory of God or the entanglements of our own desires that seek self just I mean, what, what's on that list is not determined at all in most recovery groups front. In fact, it's so wide open, that's, the, that's the, evidently what's made them work in society, that the higher power is wide open and the list on the moral inventory is wide open and everything's wide open so that the dynamic seems to be we're just all there doing these things together. So I would just want to say that determining the answer to the question of what do you do to make sure your groups are most biblical is that if you're going to use anything like that, if you are more given to step Christianity than Larry Crabb is, than to take each one of them as a pastor and say, this is what we mean by high power. This is what we mean by moral inventory. This is what you just go right down the line and, and fill them up. But I, I have not uh, made any attempt to think that through our small group system here is just wide open and my teaching is from Sunday morning and I think there's a sense in which the priorities of our church and the centrality of God are such that I'm hoping they find their way into those groups. I'll, I don't have a lot to add to that other than, uh, you know, if you're looking for a critique, a Christian critique of the, of the 12 steps, there are plenty of them out there. There are attempts on the part of some to, uh, to redeem the 12 steps. Uh, John White in his book, Changing on the Inside, addresses the subject of the 12 steps. Uh, Nancy Groom in her book, from bondage to bonding, um, escaping codependency, embracing biblical love, goes through and, and, and critiques the 12 and tries to redeem those that are redeemable. Um, there is a new book out by William Playfair called The Useful Lie that is extremely critical of any attempt to redeem the 12 steps and uh, uh, just uh, is, a, is a very negative response to it. I just have one comment about something that was, I think it was in the previous question, that, and this may be going off the deep end and opening a big can of worms, but it, it strikes me in one respect that the uh, codependency movement is trying to fix something that isn't broken when it says that we need to get people to love themselves more. I don't know if it's humanly possible not to love yourself, and I'm... I'm I realize that notions of self-contempt and, and so-called low self-esteem are valid. They occur, but I don't think the reason for it is because we haven't loved ourselves. I think perhaps the problem is that we have loved ourselves uh, excessively and unbiblically um, uh, in certain regards. So I, I'm, I have problems in, in identifying a movement uh, or approving a movement whose principal point of identification is um, we have we need to get people to love themselves more. I don't think that's a problem. Uh, I really don't, personally. The question is uh, addressed to Dr. Winter about the effect of the codependency movement either to erode uh, a sense of uh, other-centeredness uh, or not to affect it among the uh, World Missionary Task Force. Um, <clears throat> in looking forward to this conference, I read through a, a number of books, uh, current books of all kinds on this general subject, and I also uh, polled several of the major mission boards and their personnel offices and asked them, you know, are the candidates coming in in worse shape than before, or what's the problem, and what do you do about it? And I did a lot of those things. And, and of course, I will be mentioning some of this tomorrow. But um, I don't think there's a major difference just because of the codependency fad, let's say. I mean, there are other fads that are almost equivalent to it. And the terminology changes every so often. You know, this latest issue of leadership says this is not going to go away and all that sort of thing. I don't think the problem is going to go away, but the terminology is going to be outmoded. In fact, boundaries are coming in. The latest book by the Minerth Meyer people, you know, talks about boundaries. In, in fact, right today in my church, or excuse me, at the end of this week, 
you know, the end of last week, Saturday, Friday and Saturday, the Minerth Meyer Clinic, which is uh, spreading, you know, um, has um, gone beyond its codependency emphasis into a boundary seminar now. But it, it amounts to the same sort of thing. And then you see these grace books that talk about, you know, everyone's discovering grace because it's another way to, uh, you know, no matter what went wrong, you're okay. And uh, uh, I uh, commented, now our, my staff are relatively younger people, and they've got all the maladies you can think of, you know. But um, I made a comment about uh, David Seaman's book. Now, David Seaman's is a very perceptive minister who early in the game began to utilized psychological concepts in his ministry, and he was noted for that. And so the missing ingredient is grace. And so the the title of the book has great big word grace, and there's two or three other books. The, that approach and the some of these other approaches. Um, so I made a comment to our staff, well, you know, hey, let's, if you go in the Bible, grace is not... Um, sort of a transaction that happens in heaven. It's, it's not getting your credit rating in heaven uh, raced, you know, merely. It, it's an empowerment. Grace in the New Testament is, is uh, power. The grace of God was with him. It didn't mean his, his record, his credit record was erased, but that God's power and presence was there. And Paul said, hey, uh, give joyously. And if you don't feel like it, God will give you the grace to give joyously. There was no alternative to giving joyously. And the grace meant the difference. Well, young people today are looking for excuses for what they can't or don't want to do. And um, codependency helps them, and barriers help them, and and everything, all the books. Every book you almost think of now gives people excuses for not really giving their utmost for his highest. And that's a very pervasive thing, so that um, young families, uh, you know, there's, they're all the time telling you, oh, no, I can't do it, can't do it, you know, preserve the family or whatever it is, preserve my own self-worth or preserve something or other. You know, there's very uh, um, preserving, self-loving atmosphere that just pervades the, the, the candidates. And I, I heard from one of these um, agencies that, some of the missionaries are going out and saying, look, we're going to put in eight hours a day, period. You know, our, we've been taught to draw the line. Well, you know, that's a generally good idea. You don't want to knock yourself out. You're, you know, you have to live to fight another day. But the very attitude, or you, you see it in, in women. Uh, well, it's my husband. He's the missionary, not me. You know, I'm, I'm going to be doing crossword puzzles or something. And, and um, I, I really... Um, it is a very difficult thing. Now, Wycliffe is the group, that they're the largest uh, uh, group in terms of going into this sort of thing. At one time, they had 14 full-time family counselors on their staff. And I got a whole sheaf of materials from them. And it is really lurid reading, uh, the, the kind of thing they're having to deal with. But I think the consensus is we're not going to escape this problem. We're just going to have to plow through it and somehow deal with these people and help them out. And it's part of the boomer generation and the changing of the generations in terms of attitudes. There's many, many things that come into it. I'm not sure that's a good answer to your question, but it it, it, it does show up. I've, I feel a little funny, though, at this conference, because what difference does it really make to you people if the missionaries are having problems? Uh, your problems are something else, and maybe... Uh, there can be some light shed on your problem by those who are dealing with the same problem. And in that sense, it would be relevant to this group. But uh, I really sort of feel out of place in this panel even because um, um, we're both dealing with the same kind of clay and so forth. And that's, in a sense, more important than the fact that we happen to be missionaries and you happen to be pastors. It's a question directed to the whole panel, and it, it, I think it has to do with uh, whether what priority there is to uh, the inward look, uh, especially in relation to the more traditional theological language of uh, the New Testament. 
Sure, why not? Um, I think the inside look thing has gotten out of hand. I know my book is called Inside Out, and I think that the emphasis that I attempted to have in the book, I, I do think is a biblical emphasis. It basically came out of the Matthew 23 passage where the Lord said that uh, um, you, you, wanna, you, you, you need to clean the inside of the cup and dish as opposed to just kind of polishing the outside and looking good. And then he compared the Pharisees to, to, to white and sepulchers, that the stones were painted white so that the Jews on their way to ceremonial religion wouldn't have to be defiled by touching it. And he said, that, but your lives on the inside are a mess. And I want you to deal with the inside things as opposed to simply polishing the outside. And my, my contention is that, is that it's very easy for us to focus on that which we can more easily control, which is outside appearances. And uh, to put it in somewhat trite terms, as long as we have our devotions and we're in church every Sunday and we're not beating our wives and not watching porno flicks, then somehow we're spiritual. And my thought is we can be measuring up externally, but our hearts can still be a mess as evidenced in the way that we relate to others. Are we the kind of people that draw others to the Savior? Is there an aroma about us? Is there a gladness about our souls? Are we always down? I get down sometimes. If I'm always down, I think that's cause for taking a look at my relationship with the Lord, what I know about Him. Um, so I think there was a, a really a, a definite place for an inside look, if by that you mean don't be content with merely external appearances, because our Lord wasn't content with that. He made that very clear to the Pharisees. But the other thing I would say is this, that I don't encourage, I don't go around obsessing about myself, or when I do, I think I'm wrong. I didn't spend this morning wondering what are my motivations for getting behind the pulpit this morning. I got my talk ready and got up and enjoyed talking to y'all. And whether I was full of this motive or that motive or something else, I'm sure, and it'll come out someday. Until then, I'm going to have lunch and get on with life. Please turn the tape over now for the remainder of the message. Um, I'm not going to fuss with that a whole lot, but I do think that they, that 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 uh, the life of Jonah is not, not, not too bad an illustration. When God said to Jonah, I want you to go preach to um, Nineveh, and Jonah said, no, I won't, God at that point did not respond by saying, you need counseling. He put him inside a belly of a fish for a couple of days, which I take to be more discipline than, than counseling. But then after there was obedience, and then when the anger came, then chapter 4 was an inside look. Therefore, I would suggest that if a person comes to me and says, I'm having an affair, and I want to understand why, my thought would be that before we take an inside look, we've got to deal with some very simple biblical absolutes. Now, in your struggle to be obedient, if there are things to understand about your soul that can facilitate further expressions of the obedient desires of your heart, then I'm willing to take an inside look and do what sounds more like psychological stuff, which I don't think is psychological at all. I think it's biblical. I don't see myself as a psychologist. I see myself as a rather poor theologian of sanctification. And that's much more my intent than to be a psychologist. So there's a place for an inside look as opposed to just an external rearrangement of our cosmetics so we look good. But there's no place for an inside look when it is used as a narcissistic desire to enjoy exploring the riches of my internal intrigue while I continue to go on moving in directions that are not pleasing to the Lord. Okay, I think John's directing the question again to Dr. Crabb and seeing a distinction between psychological issues and depravity and wondering whether you're ruling out the former. No, I don't see that I'm ruling out the former at all, um, but I do think that, I, I do think I believe that, that the Bible addresses the former. I think there's more to be concerned with than, than, than the fact that I'm depraved and that uh, my depravity interacts with the way life has treated me. I think there certainly is that. I think that's foundational. Um, but I think there are other issues to be concerned with as well. I think a full-orbed biblical view of people includes the issue that I was designed for relationship. And I, and I, I, I was designed, uh, I think, a little girl. I think there are real distinctions in boys and girls. And I think one of the distinctions in little girl is that she was built, um, uh, she was designed to be deeply enjoyed. To put it a little bit stereotypically, I think a boy was designed to be deeply respected. And I think when that little boy is demeaned and not respected at all, does that cause um, something to take place inside of him 
that in our culture we might call a psychological problem. I, I have no difficulty with that. Believing that that little boy is going to have some struggles. He doesn't feel respected at all. The little girl longs to be enjoyed. Her father used her in ways he never should have. Therefore, she was illegitimately enjoyed in ways she wasn't designed to be. I'm willing to deal with two pivot points in the human personality. One is the issue of sin, depravity, arrogance, building your own city and self-sufficiency, digging your own cisterns and all that kind of thing as a foundational issue as to what's wrong with people. But I'm also willing to deal with the fact that I was built to enjoy a certain kind of relationship that I've never enjoyed outside of Christ. And that leaves me scared. It leaves me hurting. It leaves me longing for more. And the proper response to that, it seems to me, is not the rebuke of sin, but the, but the encouragement to hope. Because the day is coming when everything that I was designed to be is going to be fully realized and, and, and lived out in perfect design and glorification. Until then, I want to be moving in that direction. So I would not want you to hear me saying that all you ever deal with with your clients, and this is where I think I tend to be misunderstood. I, I don't want to be saying that any client that walks in right away, boom, boom, depravity, you're a sinner, shape up. I hope I've communicated something other than that. Um, but I want to communicate very strongly that there are other issues in the human soul that we do hurt because we long for things that are not yet. We live out of the garden. We were not designed to live out of the garden. We live in a world where people don't love perfectly. I was designed to be loved perfectly, and I've never been loved perfectly by anybody except my Lord. And, and therefore, I, I struggle with that. I wasn't loved perfectly by that man in the seminar who accosted me before I had to speak. I wasn't designed to receive that kind of abuse. And do I have a bit of a scar from that? Yeah, that bugs me some. That's hard. And I feel like, yeah, I wish you'd have given me the benefit of the doubt, and I, I wish you'd have been a little more sensitive to me, and that hurts me that you didn't. Am I carrying that with me? Yeah, to some degree. And if that gets in the way, though, of my functioning toward my wife, then the issue is depravity. Okay, this is a question directed to Pastor Piper and Pastor Storms, um, indicating that... Um, there have been efforts to, to move people through a 12-step program that have failed. There's no breakthrough. And wondering about the place of deliverance and warfare praying to achieve that break, breakthrough. John, you want to begin? I don't think there's any wrongdoing in it, unless your motives are wrong or you do anything unbiblical. In fact, it, it seems to me the more I listen to all these things, the more... Uh, what it all boils down to is that nobody really knows what to do in any particular moment for any particular need except God. And therefore, tuning in to what God wants to do at any particular moment is very important. And therefore, it may not be at the end of the 12 steps that you would do this spiritual warfare, but you would discern almost immediately there's something here of an extraordinarily evil kind that has oppressed and harassed or possessed this person for some time and needs to be confronted head-on in a extensive kind of prayer battle. So I'm sure open to that. We do some of that here, and you've probably seen a lot more than we've seen, but I think more and more of that is coming. The intractability of certain bondages and habits drives counselors and pastors right up the wall. There's no point in us pointing our finger because we're all confronted with problems in people's lives that seem not to budge. And therefore, more and more, I think we're asking whether Satan has a bigger hand in this than we had thought. And if so, are there dimensions of confrontation and kinds of praying that we have not used and we need to discover how to use? I'm looking. The question you ask is, uh, is one that perhaps is foremost in my thinking right now. This is, if I can use the terms, this is the next great frontier for my thinking. And I, uh, the very question you ask is what I asked Larry at breakfast this morning. And I wish we would have taped it. He had some excellent comments. And I, I'd even invite him to respond uh, as well. But I, I wrestle with this question too. At what point do I begin to wonder, as John said, if perhaps there is a demonic component in an individual's uh, struggle and in their habitual defeat. And I'm not sure I have any clear answers for that right now. I I'll, I'll share with you I, uh, the example that I gave with Larry, and it goes back to this lady that I mentioned a moment ago um, who's had the s significant struggles. After three lengthy hospitalizations, 
and after extensive uh, work, and I'm, I, I can honestly say that I'm, I'm sure there are things that I don't know, obviously, but I, I did my best to leave no stone unturned. We explored and worked through countless problems, and it just seemed as if she was existing. She wasn't suicidal anymore, but there was no joy. There was no freedom. Last September, she was released from her last hospitalization in June. And this last September, I gave her Neil Anderson's book, The Bondage Breaker, and asked her to read through it and pray through it and work through it. And uh, it was in conjunction with the fact that I'm teaching a series on spiritual warfare now at our church. And um, she, I don't know if someday I'll have to uh, eat my words, but she has, uh, the Lord has done for her a 180, as it were. And there is a freedom now and a joy and a deliverance, if you want to use that term in a, in a good sense, that she has never known before. And she attributes it to the fact that she took very seriously what uh, Anderson said in the book. She, she began to realize who she was in Christ, her identity as a, as a new creation, the authority that is hers as one who has been raised up and seated with him in the heavenlies, the resources spiritually that are, that are available to her through the indwelling Holy Spirit. Uh, she went through the steps as he outlined. She prayed the prayers with a, a heartfelt fervency and sincerity. And she is now ad admitted to me what I suspected uh, all along, that indeed there were certain spiritual phenomena going on in her life that she was utterly ashamed and embarrassed to tell me about, fearful that I would conclude she was really nuts and I wouldn't want to deal with her any longer. And uh, she has truly, I can tr she's truly been set free. And it makes me wonder, well, uh, somebody might ask, well, why didn't you bring this in at the very beginning of the two years? And I, you know, again, this is something that I think I would really like to hear Larry repeat a little bit of what he said to me. I, I think that there was great, great maturing in her relationship with Christ, her understanding of God, her, her appreciation of grace through the process that we went through and dealing with issues relating to her husband, relating to the sexual abuse in her, in her childhood, uh, relating to her relational style as a so-called good girl. Um, so many things that uh, were designed, at least in my intent, to drive her to the cross and to that raw dependency on Jesus. And I, uh, I would not, I don't think I, at this point I would have reversed the, the method and the process with her. Now, with somebody else, it might be different. As John said, uh, you know, I, I now in my ministry, before someone comes in, I spend some considerable time in prayer. Lord, if there is a, a, a distinctive demonic component in, in this person's problem, that needs to be dealt with at the outset, please make me sensitive to it. Give me the right questions to ask. Direct our conversation in the proper uh, uh, area. Uh, and perhaps with that, uh, uh, this can be handled at the outset in some cases. But I don't think there's a, a rule that you can apply to every single individual. Um, I think there are many, many instances in which, though there may be a demonic uh, element that needs to be addressed, it may be something that comes uh, after uh, uh, the so-called inside look in the way that Larry has described it. Larry, do you want to add something about uh, the issue of... I concur. Okay. Uh, Ralph, maybe we could ask your uh, opinion about uh, the, uh, the praying for deliverance and uh, warfare counseling uh, through prayer in... Uh, the third world and, and uh, on the frontiers? Well, of course, I suppose most of you realize that the average missionary has been involved long before. I remember a friend of mine who was uh, speaking to a group of people in, in Pakistan after getting out of seminary and going through all the normal theology courses and so forth. And here this 16-year-old uh, kid just ran screaming down the aisle and just threw himself at the feet of, the, of this missionary and was just writhing and 
and uh, he thought, let's see, which course did I take that, uh, you know, and, um, but the people that were there, the, this was nothing special for them, and uh, they prayed for this young man and so forth, but um, it's something that we somehow haven't gotten into our um, theological seminaries uh, quite yet. I think, though, that on the other hand, you don't have to, it isn't a matter of formulas and special names and terminology. Virtually every thing that we touch or think about has a demonic element to it, it seems to me. I mean, is there anybody here who doesn't believe that Satan exists? And if he does, don't you suppose he has something to do with practically everything? I remember as a kid, I, th I thought it was a joke. Someone, it was going around, you know, in the Sunday school, someone said, well, are you having any trouble with Satan? And the guy would say, no. Well, then the answer was, well, maybe he's not having any trouble with you. And uh, I, th th it took me 25 years to realize, well, you know, maybe that's a very he much heavier uh, observation than I had recognized it to be. And I think that now the, the rise of the occult in this country, the the Satanism, even the police departments getting, uh, becoming aware of this sort of thing. There is a quantitatively, distinctly greater amount of this kind of overt demonic activity. But I don't think it's radically different from anything in the past. I don't think when we pray to the living God that there's a, there's, we're dealing with somehow with another God now who has trouble with Satan, the one we used to pray to, had solved all those problems. And I do think that um, the, somehow the coefficient of belief in a city, for example, has a lot to do with how much there is. And I do think that uh, immigration brings uh, problems to this country, even as we, emigrating, take problems with us to the field, diseases and so forth that the people didn't know. So I think it's a very real thing. I don't... You know, if this question had come up five years ago, there would have been a lot of people on the edge of their seat and so forth. But now, you know, it just seems like maybe, I don't know, I come from California, maybe in other parts of the country why this is a, an upsetting subject. But uh, it really is sort of humdrum, uh, you know. Uh. Yes, Well, I won't try and paraphrase that, uh, but uh, Sam, could you begin and then Larry take it? It's it's from a youth pastor and asks about uh, what a youth pastor can do to protect. I guess I am going to paraphrase it. Protect uh, and uh, fortify children against the abuses of the self-help and recovery movement. I'm not so sure that the solutions are going to be that much different from the ones we would use for adults. Um, perhaps the questions that uh, kids are asking are, are significantly different, but I'm not sure that the answers that we're going to give are. I, uh, I'll confess to you, I struggled for a long time and still do with the problems of teenagers in, in our young people. And uh, if, if there ever were 
uh, an instance in which I would refer. It's when somebody came in and said, I've got a problem with my kid. And I'd say, well, let me see if I can find somebody who can help you with that. Um, because I really didn't understand a lot of the, uh, of the thinking and the mentality uh, of our kids. And, um, again, I'm not trying to put you off by recommending you go read something. Uh, I'm not trying to uh, escape answering the question. But I have been helped tremendously uh, by Kevin Huggins' book, uh, Parenting Adolescence, is that the name of his book? Uh, which I find to be a tremendously insightful treatment of what's going on inside the minds and the hearts of our kids. What are their deepest longings? What are their greatest fears? Uh, what are their legitimate as well as illegitimate needs? Um, what are the, what's going on in, in their hearts? And, and as well as a result of the uniqueness of uh, contemporary society, you know, it's, it's, it is a different world from the one that I was raised in as a kid in the 50s and 60s. Um, and I find tremendous. I found tremendous help in that book. Uh, it gives, I think, and it's not just for parents of adolescents. I think it is also for. In fact, he has seminars for youth workers. Um, and I know that you can, if you want. I don't know if you've heard of him or his seminars. If you have, okay. I was going to say, if those those of you who haven't, uh, you can write to Larry's ministry at IBC in Morrison, Colorado, and get. Uh, I'm sure you get information from there. Do you want to say something that's a lot more helpful than what I've said? I'll recommend one more book and then make a few comments. If you have not read um, the book by Jack Miller called Come Back Barbara, it's not a very well-known book. I don't know why it didn't sell better. To me, it was the most helpful book I ever read. Kevin's I put number two and Jack's for other reasons I put number one. Um, it's a book where a pastor at, uh, uh, was pastoral ministry director, I think, at Westminster for some years had a daughter who at age 18 rebelled thoroughly, went and spent eight years in total decadent living, lived with seven different men, got involved in the drug culture. And it tells the story of how Jack tried to minister grace to his daughter through this. And after each stay, after each chapter where he describes how he and his wife Rosemary dealt with their, dealt with their daughter, Barbara, who at age 26 or something ended up, uh, the, the, the bartender she was living with became a Christian. <laughs> and, and uh, led his girlfriend to the Lord. They got married, and the bartender is now a youth pastor in Jack's church. Um, and, yeah, it's one, of those, it's one of those nice stories. They don't always end like that, but this one does. And, um, and, and Barbara, as, a, as an older adult now, back to the Lord, she writes the sequel to each of Jack's chapters that was happening inside of her life as Jack was trying to deal with her in different ways. It's a very insightful, hel helpful, wonderful book. I'd say that. The other thing I'd say is um, probably the person who I have the most affinity toward in terms of youth work is a woman named Melissa Trevathan in Nashville, Tennessee with Daystar Ministries. Um, and if, if she were here, she just taught a class for us at a, our program last week, actually. If she were here, I think she'd say something like this, and I would applaud it. She's the most effective person I know in working with adolescents. Um, she focuses on providing the kids with a kind of relationship that, that touches deeply into their souls. She gets the kids to tell their stories. That's a big phrase with her, getting the kids to tell their stories. And as the kids tell their stories, um, and she listens very deeply to the pain, the struggles, treats them with great respect. The other thing which, which she does and which I, which I would teach very strongly is that as they tell their stories, you've got to explore what I call their style of relating. Um, this would apply to adults as well as youngsters, but with the adolescents, as they tell their stories, start, start exposing the ways that they're relating to people and the motivations beneath it, the self-protective motivations that are going on beneath the surface as they, as they relate. I don't think you're going to get a window into the soul that's any clearer than the motivations behind our styles of relating. And in, in dealing with kids, I think that the issues that can counter some of the errors of the codependency movement are most surfaceable by talking about style of relating kind of things. When a kid sits there in a group, let's say, and is very, very shy, uh, to say, you know, tell me, it's been about an hour and a half of group now, you haven't said a word. What's going through you as you're sitting there? Um, I notice you've been in our group now for 10 weeks and you really don't talk much at all. I wonder why. Is this the way you are at home? Tell me your story. Tell me how this has become your style of relating to be terribly shy. What does it accomplish for you? One of my basic presuppositions is what I call a teleological model, that everything we do has an agenda. Everything is aiming in a direction. 
And if a child is sitting there silent for 10 weeks of a group, there's an agenda that that child is honoring by saying nothing. And that agenda needs to be exposed as, as achieving something, um, using the group to achieve something for that, for that particular person's well-being. And you can begin to expose the kind of things in that child's soul that can drive them to the Savior. Um, so I think that kind of telling story, looking at not relating to me are the central issues that I'd be concerned with in dealing with, with, with the adolescent population. Question for Dr. Crabb. Uh, summarize your view on the gay and lesbian orientation and on their overtures to be a part of the Orthodox Church. It's always required that we start with what's clear in Scripture. And I would argue, and I presume most of us would be in agreement, that that, that God uh, does not regard homosexuality as, a, as, an, as an optional alternative, that it's, that it's something that he says is a perversion. And that word said not in a slang phrase, but is a, it's a distortion, a disfigurement, a perversion of his design. So we need to simply start with that absolute, with that teaching from the Scripture, I think. And then I think once we, once we stand firm and say this is not to be, then suppose the... Um, the person comes to you and says, I agree with that, but the urges are very, very strong. I was in Germany last summer doing a seminar with uh, OCSC, a missionary organization, and um, that works with, with, with servicemen. And one of the missionaries came to me and he said, I have about five servicemen right now, five American military folks, guys, that, that have a homosexual orientation, but they're Christians, and they, don't, they, they know it's wrong, and they want with all their strength to not yield to these particular urges, but they live in dorms with other guys. And the way he put it to me, I don't mean to be crass or inappropriate here, but he said it would just be like me, the, the missionary speaking, a heterosexual, living in a girl's dorm. And all the sexual provocation is, is going on, he said. And these guys are going through the dickens every day with their urges and their struggles and their tensions. But once we start with the biblical absolute that it's wrong, we must do more than simply command them not to yield. We must stand firm against the homosexual movement, working to grant um, our endorsement of that as an acceptable alternative, that as long as you have a covenantal relationship, it's an appropriate thing for Christians. We need to stand firm against that. But then we need to start thinking heavily, I think, about what is going on inside of the, the image bearer, the Christian who loves the Lord, who still struggles with perverted sexual desires. Uh, so we can help these servicemen and help the folks in this room. If we, you know it's not right for us to raise our hands, I don't think we need to exhibit our, our dirty linen. But, but I do think that in a room of how many guys here, 150 guys, that um, there's a there's a third that that struggle with some sort of very perverted, uh, aberrant uh, desire. Um, some of you it's pornography, some of you it's exhibitionism, some it's transvestism, some it's homosexuality, um, some it's necrophilia. There's all sorts of things that are going on, uh, bestiality, all sorts of things are happening. Um, I, I see it all, and this is, I, I need two hours to say it well, so if in just in two minutes I, don't, I won't say it well. It'll sound simplistic and caricatured, but I don't know how to do any better. I, I see it all ultimately as a perversion of what it means to be a man or what it means to be a woman. I think that um, that God, I think you ought to read uh, Piper and Grudem on recovering biblical manhood and womanhood. I think it's an excellent, heavy, um, heavy in the sense of well thought through, biblical resource for thinking through that there are distinctions, that the Bible has different roles, different responsibilities. Uh, I'm not egalitarian in my, or in my orientation. Um, I think that there are distinctions that must be honored. And I think that to get to the root of the matter, we have to say that there's something about being a man that is terribly unique. I'm willing to go so far in metaphorical language of saying that my soul has as masculine a shape as my body. Now that's a metaphor because the soul is not a thing which you can measure in a microscope somewhere. But I believe that the essence of who I am is male and the essence of who the ladies are is female and there's something very distinct about that. What that means to me is that a man is required to move into his world where there is no clear code for how to move using his courageous resources on behalf of another person to, to create a response. That's a bunch of gobbledygook. What I mean is this, that when I'm in the middle of a fight with my wife, I don't have a clue what to do. I read the marriage bill and I don't get help. <laughs> and what I tend to do then is go where I'm pretty sure of myself. I was giving a uh, Bible study for the Broncos, who didn't quite make it to the Super Bowl. 
um, about two months ago, and, a, and a, a, one of the big, strong, well-known players, if I gave you his name, you'd know it, was sitting in the Bible study, and he's a big, strong, tough guy. He just beats people up every Sunday afternoon. His wife's about 5'4", weighs 115, and he's terrified of her. And I said to her, I said, when does, I'll give him a name, Frank, it's not his real name. I said, when does, when does Frank, when does Frank back away from you? And she said, well, sometimes when I get mad at him and I just tell him I'm so angry with him, he just backs away. And so I turned to him, Frank, I said, Frank, what do you feel at that point? And here's this big, strong guy went like this. He said, I don't know what to do. And what I said was, you don't have a playbook. And when you don't have a playbook, when a man doesn't have a playbook, he backs away and goes to where he has a playbook. I think a man is somebody who leads into uncertainty because of his relationship with the Lord, creating movement into the world on behalf of the other representing Christ. I think that's manhood. I think a woman is somebody who is willing to trust the Lord enough to make her resources available for the encouragement of others. I think there's a very definite masculinity and, and femininity that's very, very distinct. And I think that most men, when they don't have a, most men don't have fathers. I mean, we all have biological fathers, but in a very rich sense of the term, how many of you have a father in the sense of somebody who's walking the road ahead of you who uh, is able to look back and you respect that man because he survived the pitfalls of life? He's made his mistakes, but he's going on for the Lord in strong ways. And he looks back at you, his kid. Maybe you're 20, maybe you're 50. I'm 47. And, he, and your dad looks back at you and, and says, uh, as he watches you struggle, he says, I believe in you. You can make it. And then turns around and keeps going. Doesn't come back and help. He somehow believes in you from a distance and keeps on setting the path and walks ahead. How many have that? Very, very few. And as a result, I think very, very few men feel deeply affirmed that they have what it takes to create in chaos in the absence of a code and to move into a person's life. When that sense of masculinity is badly demeaned because of all kinds of difficult things in the background, then I think that a man who longs for intimacy, like all image bearers long for intimacy, wants to find some intimate relationship without ever having having to exercise the parts of masculinity that he's scared to exercise. Homosexuality provides that alternative. Therefore, it seems to me that the, ulti- the, the, the way to deal with the homosexual is to, is to deepen his understanding of masculinity and what it means to get that masculinity expressed. A good friend of mine has had major homosexual struggles over the years. And um, the major thing that has helped him, he's been married. They were When I first uh, spent time with him, they were separated, and he was... They, they, just, they didn't have any sex. He didn't have desires for his wife. The marriage was falling apart. And the thing that really began to help was, was when, and this is so simplistic to say it quickly, but, but when he began to see some deep struggles in his wife and he was willing to take the risk that there was something he could do in moving toward her using resources God had built in him on, on, on her behalf, as he began doing that, the, the homosexual urges became far less strong and far less obsessive. Uh, we as men are called to pass on life. Physically, we enter our wives and pour forth into and create life. I think that's also a metaphor. It's a physical reality in sex and the marriage relationship. But I think it's also, I move toward my wife, I move toward my children. As pastor, I move toward my church, and I pour forth a very masculine image. But if I believe I have nothing to pour forth with, if I've been castrated, then I'm going to find some other way to feel good about myself. And if my threat has been severe, pornography might not do it. I might need to go to another man where resources of masculinity are not nearly as required as they are with a woman. Uh, My wife is as woman as you can get. And what I've often said about her, and this sounds unkind, I mean it as an incredible compliment. People, I've said it before and people have said, boy, that was unkind. What 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 I've said is this, that when you're married to a real woman, you've got two choices, be a man or kill yourself. Beautiful. Could I just add one thing? And this is a, a very, that was lovely. <laughs> this is on tape, isn't it? Good. Oh, good. Just looking at this as a, as a father of two daughters, and John could maybe testify as the father of four sons, or Larry is of two sons. What can we do just in our own homes? And relating to the issue of homosexuality, I think the greatest influence I can have on my daughters in terms of their uh, sexual orientation is to show them concretely and authentically and genuinely what it is to love their mother, to love my wife. Because one day, my oldest daughter's 13. She turned 13 in December. Well, she turned 13 several years ago. Technically, she became 13 in December. 
some guy's going to come up to her, and for whatever reason he may have, he's going to say, Melanie, I love you. And I hope that she will, when she hears that for the first time, be able to evaluate it and say, what does that mean? How do I know? And I, I'm hoping and praying with God's help that she'll be able to say to herself, uh, does this guy treat me like my dad treats my mom? And I hope that uh, her desire for a, a lifelong loving relationship with a member of the opposite sex is going to be to some degree the product of what she has seen in terms of my relationship with her mother. And I think the same will in some re- respects go for uh, sons who who are going to know what they mean or don't mean when they tell a young girl they love her. And when they begin to pursue the opposite sex in light of what they have seen in their own fathers and how they've loved their wives. Bruce, wait the back. He's going to try. Okay. Bruce and then Kim. For Dr. Winter, <laughs> I need to hear the last. Question. Amen. <laughs> what, what's your last phrase again? Yeah, the last question. What, what, what was that? You say there's a movement that you mean the anti-spiritual abuse authority movement. Yeah, I know that. Well, there is in the so-called charismatic sphere uh, a quite different attitude toward revelation for individuals than there is in the, let's say, the straight evangelical sphere. Although, ultimately, in the entire pietist tradition, there's not a whole lot of ultimate difference because whether you're a straight evangelical or a charismatic, uh, there is for almost everyone the, the resource of saying, well, you know, I really think the Lord wants me to do this. And then who's going to tell you no? Uh, young people come to me and say, well, they really think God wants them to go to China. I say, well, then go ahead. You know, but I often tell them, I doubt it. I just tell them, I doubt it. They say, God told me to do this. I tell them, I doubt it. And it really shakes them up because you're not supposed to say that because God really does speak to people. Now, when I went to seminary, why... Of course, maybe it was a little backward, but I remember the homiletics professor telling about this famous preacher, it wasn't Spurgeon, who had these tremendously enlightened uh, messages, and, and some lady came to him after a service one time and said, you know, you know it's, it's amazing. God really speaks to you, doesn't he, while you're preaching? 
And he said, um, no, I don't think so. She said, well, you mean he never speaks to you while you're preaching? No, I don't think so. Oh, oh once, once, once the Lord spoke to me. But that was after I finished. She said, well, what did he say? What did he say? Uh, he said, you didn't prepare enough. <laughs> Now that's that's kind of a that's sort of the flip side of the of the thing. Now I know in YWAM circles, for example, Lauren Cunningham one time spoke to our staff and and it was really a, impressive because while we have quite a few people in this sphere on our staff, nevertheless the overall tone is is straight evangelical. So anyway, he said now and I don't know how this came up. He said, well, now, when some young person tells you that it's God's will for them to do this or to do this or to go here or to go there or to take some different job or whatever, he said, you need to ask them these uh, seven questions. And I can't remember what they were, but they were something like, um, well, yeah, that's fine. In other words, you wouldn't contradict the fact that God spoke to them because that's counterproductive. But then you say, but uh, is now the time? Is this the time? that God wants you to do that? Or uh, is this the way in which he wants you to do it? Or, uh, you know, are you the person that he wants to do this? And I said to myself, after you ask all those seven questions, nobody, nobody would have any confidence in what they thought God told them to do. And, and I think the so-called charismatic leaders of our time, the, the Jack Haffords and so forth, they they are much better able than I to deal with people who get direct revelations all through the day, every day, and and are always telling you that uh, they're essentially unleadable. You can't assign them a job. You can't ask them to do something because you're running up against God every time. And um, so all I can say is each cultural tradition has its own ways of coping with that particular problem. Um, but just in general, now, you know, I really think that one of the things about this discussion, I, I'm going to try to do something about this tomorrow, this is so culture-bound, this whole discussion, so U.S., and we're not asking what the cross-cultural validity of some of these things would be, but one of the things you see radically differently in almost all mission field churches is a far greater uh, spiritual authority uh, within the group. And you don't have individuals in the congregation uh, being led directly from moment to moment, but you do have a sense of God speaking to the group and to individuals through the group to the extent that if you took the average mission field church and plopped it down in this country, why people would be up in arms. They'd say, this is over-shepherding. This is manipulation. You're, you know, you're really overriding people's personal sense of guidance. And our whole pietist tradition, which emphasizes individual experience, would, uh, would react against what is common. Now, why is that? Well, it's partly because most traditional societies still do have social structure. They have what are called families, which do not exist. <laughs> You know, they don't exist in this country. There's no such a thing. An article that I read recently by the, the principal, the, the actually the president of the theological seminary in Singapore that used to be liberal that went conservative. <laughs> uh, you know, the evangelicals have just taken over Singapore. And um, so he was writing on what he called filial piety because in the Chinese society of Singapore, why family... Uh, piety, honor of parents, and so forth, is very strong. You wouldn't even find an article on that subject in this country. And uh, so there are many, many differences, uh, you know, from culture to culture, but especially between the U.S. culture, which has gone further, faster, and more, I would say, more malignantly, malignantly against and away from authority, from social uh, structure, and so forth. And we're almost uh, a basket case. I mean, the greatest impediment to the missionary movement today is the gospel that we preach. Now, we don't preach pornography. We don't preach high divorce rate. We don't preach uh, children rebelling against parents. 
Well, although I, I've seen missionary movies that tell, tell young people that if you don't say no to your parents, you can't be a Christian. But Because, of course, the parents would tell them they couldn't. But, I mean, um, we really do have a, a ghastly backdrop to, to preach from overseas. I, I don't know who it would be, Muslim, Hindu, that would ever want what we have to offer in terms of family life and uh, prison life. We have 22 times as many people behind bars even as in West Germany, proportionate to our population. And so we, you know, we're working relatively within what was true two years ago or, or the, uh, the, the curves that are going up or going down or whatever. But the difference between our society and the traditional societies of the world are such that most American evangelical families would be blessed just by being familiar with a pagan family. Uh, overseas. Very greatly blessed. But that's another subject. And I... yeah, we only have another min- minute or so. Oh, you need to go to your telephone interview, Tom says. Um, Bruce, my one of my bottom line concerns, n- near the bottom, in assessing the movement, calling for this conference, is the the jury is out, as far as I'm concerned, on whether groups that have devoted themselves to recovery, 12-step, uh, psychological orientation, are going to finish the Great Commission or care about it. Uh, I, I want to know that. I'm not going to jump on board. When I see people coming through Bethlehem with all my hang-ups and all the criticisms I get and all the imperfections there are, and I see people caring about finishing the Great Commission, I feel like something's being done right, even if there are a lot of sick people around who may not be getting better as fast as they'd like to get better. And, and as we look around, we need to look for models that are not just making people feel better and thus attracting big crowds, but are they getting to the Muslims and the Hindus and the Buddhists and the unreached tribal peoples and finishing the job, sick or not sick. I asked Ralph Winter coming in, I said, are are we really sicker than William Carey and his wife were sick? Now, I hope he answers that question for us tomorrow, because I think the missionary population over the past 200 years has been probably a pretty sick bunch of people, and that's my only hope. If, if, If God can't finish it with sick people, there is no hope. So I hope we hear a statement from Ralph tomorrow that, that it, it can be done because that's the way it has been done. But I have a feeling that our direct our, our focus in the name of compassion is is off of the uh, people who had no chance to hear, not just the people who haven't heard in America. Thank you for listening to this message from Desiring God, the ministry of John Piper, pastor for preaching at Bethlehem Baptist Church in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Feel free to make copies of this message for others, but please do not charge for those copies or alter the content in any way without permission. We invite you to visit Desiring God online at www dot desiringgod.org where you'll find hundreds of sermons, articles, radio broadcasts, and more, all available to you at no charge. Our online bookstore carries all of Pastor John's books, audio, and video resources, and you can also stay up to date on what's new at Desiring God. Again, our website is www.desiringgod.org or call us toll free at one eight eight eight. Three four six forty seven hundred. Our mailing address is Desiring God, twenty six zero one East Franklin Avenue, Minneapolis, Minnesota five five four zero six. Desiring God exists to help you make God your treasure because God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in Him.